Ephesians chapter 5, uh, young people, I know you just got in here and all that, and the rest of you, you just got sat down, but stand up anyway. Let's all stand up. Ephesians chapter 5, yesterday we read 17 verses in a row, but I don't want to do verse overload for these pastors. So we'll just, we'll just skip through and read a few of these verses, and then we'll pick up where we left off yesterday. Look at verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse number 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good day you've given to us. Thank you for the good time we've had all morning in this place. Lord, I just pray that in the next few minutes as we look into your word, you'd use it in our hearts and lives. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, young people, you remember I told you yesterday I would answer every question you could possibly have. Now, I'm not talking about weird questions and strange questions. I'm talking about questions that you have in your walk with God, in your Christian life, the things that you wonder about and you say, now, why do we do this? Why do we not do this? Uh, why is this a big deal? Why is that a big deal? And, and you wonder sometimes. I remember when I was sitting in a Christian school, much like you are, and, and hearing people preach, and, and sometimes a, a preacher would say something, and they would say something was right or wrong or whatever it was, and, and, and something would go off in my mind. And my thought process was, why? I, I don't understand that. Why? Why is that, why is that right? Why is that wrong? Why is that important? Why does it matter and how do we decide what's right and what's wrong and what's important? And the easiest way is when you find a verse in the Bible that tells you to do something or not do something. That's the easiest way. And then it's just a matter of obeying God. We talked about the Ten Commandments yesterday. And when God says thou shalt not lie, what he means is thou shalt not lie. You can make all the excuses and exceptions you want, but you're rebelling against God. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not steal. On and on. It's very simple. It's black and white. It's easy to get your hands around and say, okay, that's why we do that. That's why we say that. That's why we preach that. That's why that's important. The problem comes when there are things that don't have a verse. And, and if you be honest, there are a lot of things that don't have a verse. There are a lot of things in your life that don't have a verse. There's not a verse that tells you, you know, your school uniform. There's, there's not a verse that tells you how many verses of a hymn you're supposed to sing. We all know it's three, no more than three. <laughs> Only those radicals sing every verse. I don't know. And we usually skip the third one because that's not of God anyway. What? Why? There's no verse that tells you that. That's just, that's just what we do. Well, if we're not careful, we get to the point where there are a lot of things that are just what we do. And when too many things are just, that's what we do, let me just be honest with you. You're no better than the Catholic who does what he does just because that's what we do. And you say, well, here's what the Bible says. He, it's, he'll say, it doesn't matter. This is what we do. And we don't ever want to be in that place. And, and look, you guys here in the middle, look to the sides. Look, look up and down. Turn around, look. We live in a different day than when we grew up and the preacher stood up and said, this is how we dress and this is what we watch and this is what we listen to and this is what we do and this is what we don't do. And we said, yes, sir. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad or, or otherwise. I'm saying they don't live in that world. The world they live in questions everything that you say from behind that pulpit. And you'd better have something more 
then, well, that's just what we do. Because that, can we just be honest? That's a dumb answer. That's just what we do. That's a dumb answer. Because any cult can say the same thing. Any lost person can say the same thing. Any, any errant philosopher can say the same thing. We instead have an authority to guide our lives. And that is the word of Almighty God. And we need to be able to go back and say, here's what God says. Now, in the verses we just read, look again at verse 10. We talked about it yesterday, but look at it again, young people. It tells us that we can prove what is acceptable unto God. Now, now if there are things that are acceptable unto God, that means by definition, there are things that are unacceptable to God. Right? And this tells us that we can know. We can prove it. And then it tells us a little further down that Christ will give us light. And of course, Christ reveals himself to us through his word. And so this is where the answer has to come from. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. God says, if you don't understand his will, now, uh, again, we talked about it yesterday in chapel. It's not talking about, you know, your area of ministry. Where do I live? Who do I marry? What do I... We're not talking about those big questions that we always relegate to. That's the will of God. It's talking about, is the thing I'm about to do today God's will or not? Should I do it or should I not do it? Is the thing that's just been put before me as an opportunity, is that from God or is it not from God? How do you decide that if there's not a verse that says do this or don't do this? Well, the answer has to come from the word of God. And if there's not a verse, then we said yesterday, it has to be based on Bible principle. And Bible principle will guide your life and it will answer every question. But the key to allowing your life to be guided by Bible principle is verse number one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. If your heart and your desire is to follow God, to sincerely follow God, then when you come across principles in the word of God, you'll run the things in your life through those principles and you'll say, okay, this doesn't match up with the principles in the word of God. And yesterday we, we hit on a, a revolutionary concept. Once you find out something doesn't line up with the principles in the word of God, then you voluntarily remove it from your life. You don't wait until the pastor preaches on it and tells you not to do it before you remove it from your life. You run it through the principles in the word of God. And by the time he preaches on it, you've already settled it. And it's good. Amen. Too many of us wait for him to tell us not to do it or to do it. And if the preacher didn't come up to me and say, you got to stop that right now. Well, then it must be okay. That's a dangerous way to live your life. It's dangerous. Instead, you need to allow it to be guided by Bible principle. You see, Bible principles are, are better. Now, I am not, I am not in any way, shape or form. One of these dear, wonderful people. Who's, who's on the internet in the IFB cult survivors website forum. I mean, hey, if they all survived, it must not have been that bad. Amen. Look at the bright side. <laughs> I'm not one of those. As a matter of fact, I don't, I don't have a lot of patience with those. I just, I just really don't. And, and that's as far as I'll go with that because I, I might get ugly and I don't want to be ugly. I'm not one of those. I'm not a basher of independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptists. I are one. Amen? Amen. That's, that's what we are. Amen? Amen. Uh, now, we, having said all that, let me say, <laughs> if we've messed up along the line, it's probably in this very area. We've settled for giving people a list to follow instead of having them build a relationship with God so that they don't need the list. And when we're not there, they can still follow God. 
and, and we didn't do it maliciously. It wasn't done maliciously. It was done because, quite honestly, that's the fastest, easiest way to do it. That's how you get people in line and get them serving God and get them going. You just tell them what to do and how to do it, and then they go do it. The problem is, when they do stop and say, why, how, what, hmm? Then they begin to think that you lied to them, when you didn't, really. You just didn't give them everything you needed to give them. You needed to give them the how and the why and the what right from the beginning. Because that's the important part. You see, the Bible principle is far more important than the list of rules that we might have. Bible principles are general. They apply to any situation in your life. A, 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 list, of, a, a list of rules are, are very specific. They all have a very specific thing that they deal with. And of course, you have a Christian school here. Many of you have Christian schools and different things of that nature. And you understand in that setting, you have to set some rules. And you all know that over the years, the rule book grows. It grows and it grows. Why? Because you've got to keep dealing with specific issues and making a new rule. And some of you grew up in Christian schools and you have rules named after you in the book. Because you thought of ways to circumvent the, and they made a brand new rule, put your name on it. There it is. Isn't that exciting? You live on. Amen. Bible principles are general. They cover everything. Rules are very specific. Bible principles have multiple applications. You can apply them to any question you might have. And today, listen, with the, with the proliferation of the kinds of churches out there, the party churches and all the rest, these, these young people, your church members, they know people with a testimony of salvation who don't do anything like you do it. They dress differently and they act differently and they go different places and they drink different things and on and on and on. And if their only response is, well, we just don't do that, that's a dumb response. If you've been saved more than a year, you ought to have a better response than that. It ought to be better. So the, uh, the Bible principles are something that you can live by. They are eternal. Bible principles never go out of style or fashion. Specific rules are time specific. They are. They're time specific. I was joking about letting my, my beard grow. You know as well as I do. It's a time thing. You go back and look at all the, all the dead guys. All the dead guys, like Brother Marshall said, that we wouldn't let preach in our pulpit, but we read from and we quote. And all, you know, those dead guys. They all had beards. Not to mention Jesus. I just want to be like Jesus. Amen. Or get me some sandals next. Amen. But there was a time period where that was not what professional looking men did. Right? Am I right? And so that became what we, I hate to even admit this, but we followed the culture. And we said, this is what you need to look like. And if you do this, something's wrong. You are sliding down the slope. You wicked person. But you know as well as I do, it was time specific. And those fashions come and those fashions go. And it's just a passing thing and it doesn't mean anything one way or the other. I've, I've heard awesome, tremendous heart-stirring messages on the wickedness of wireframe glasses. And, and when, when it first came up, it was very appropriate. Because the only ones wearing the wire rim glasses at that time were the, were the filthy hippies who hated God and America and everything good and right. And the real Bible principle was we don't want to be identified with those who hate God. That was the real principle. But it became wire rim glasses are evil. Which, can we be honest? That's dumb. They're just a thing. They're just a thing. They have no inherent evil or goodness to them. The Bible principle is still valid. The specific went out the window a long time ago. 
And if you stood up and preached that to your people, they'd think you're crazy. They would. They'd think our preacher has lost his mind. What does he mean? Why are rimmed glasses? Are... Well, it made sense at one time, but we should have emphasized the principle rather than the specific application. You see, Bible principles, they're general, they are eternal, they never go out of style or fashion, they are cross-cultural. They will work in any culture. If you have Bible standards and positions that only work in this culture, then they're not really biblical. They're cultural. That's the truth. Real Bible principles will work in any culture. I was, I was teaching a, uh, a music course for a Bible institute in Pennsylvania. And they called me. They said, Brother Rogers, we want you to come. And, and we're going to do these. Uh, it's Monday through Friday, three hours each night, 15 hours on music. I said, Brother, you, you got the wrong guy. I can't talk about anything for 15 hours. I'll lose interest. Uh, I mean, we just can't do that. I, I, you, don't, you don't want me to do it? Call John Marshall. I said, he'll do it. He can do it. He knows stuff and he can do it. And they called him and he went and he did it. And he did a bang up job. And they called me the next year and they said, Brother Marshall did a great job. Now we want you to come do it. I said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to. He said, well, it's not really three hours every night. He said, it's broken up into 45 minute sessions. So it's three 45 minute periods and they bring snacks in between. I said, oh. What, what kind of snacks do they bring? <laughs> and they said that they bake stuff at home and they bring it. I said, I'll be there. I'll think of something to say. I'll, I'll come and I'll be there. And I went and I did my thing all week long. On Thursday night, I said, now, if you have any questions, please let me know now so I can do my best to try to cover them on Friday night. Anything I've been unclear about, anything at all, just let me know. And a young man was sitting on the front row. He was a missionary to Thailand. He was getting ready to go to Thailand. He said, Brother Rogers, here's, here's what I need to know. How do I apply the principles about music that you gave us this week? How do I do that in Thailand? Because Thai music is weird. Now, if you're not familiar with Thai music, weird is an understatement. We, we had a lady in my home church in Fairbanks, Alaska. She was a, a little short Thai lady, and she was always trying to sing Thai songs for us. And to be perfectly honest, uh, Thai music sounds like a cross between a cat stuck in the fan belt and two guys in a fight. It's like, wah, boom, wah, boom. that's what it's like. And that's the melodic, pretty stuff. And, <laughs> and I said, brother, I understand your problem. Here's the answer. Every Bible principle that I gave you that applies to music right here applies there. Still applies. He said, well, well how, what do I do? I said, oh, here's what I would do. When you first get there, you find somebody born and raised there who knows Thai music. Somebody who knows the culture, somebody who's lived there all their life. Find out what kind of music they use in their heathen temples. Find out what it looks like, what it sounds like, what they use to play it. Find out all that and then stay as far away from that as possible. And that's how I'd start. And then you apply Bible principles and stick with those. So if, if it only works here, it's not a Bible principle. It's got to work everywhere. Uh, and I, I've heard people say, you know, the only way to have truly godly music in your church, you've you got to have a piano that's godly. Uh, you don't want anything else. Well, that's, that's nice. But what do you do when you're trudging up the mountain in New Guinea? And going to start a church in a village somewhere in Africa? Or, uh, what do you do then? You can't haul one of those on your back. You mean if all I can carry is a little guitar or whatever, uh, I can't have godly music? No, of course you can we just, we just get our culture awfully wrapped up in things sometimes. The Bible principles are so much more uh, flexible and they are not cultural, uh, culturally specific. They are cross-cultural. Bible principles come from God. They come directly from this book. Our list of specific rules come from our human experience. And we make rules as we go along to solve problems. God gives us principles that take care of everything. Bible principles bring humility. 
Because if I'm going to live according to the Bible principle, what that means is I'm going to be willing to submit myself to God whenever I come across something that runs contrary to how I'm thinking or living. And I'm going to have to come back and say, okay, God, I was wrong. I'm going to do what you said in your word. That brings humility. You see, if you just live according to a list, that tends to pride. You've probably, any, any of you guys who've gone out and you've knocked on doors and, and tried to get something going and tried to invite people to church and tell them about Jesus, you've heard them say, well, I have my religion and you have yours. What they're saying is, I follow all this stuff and that's good enough. That's not good enough. They need to know Jesus Christ. You see, that list living tends to pride. And we sit there in church and we think, you know, I'm doing good. And, and the preacher preaches on getting right with God. And we say, well, of course I'm right with God. I attend church and I tithe and I give to missions and I'm in Sunday school. I'm right with God. And lots of lost people do that. They're not right with God. But we think if we've done everything, we've checked all the boxes, that makes us spiritual and right with God. And it never has and it never will. Bible principles bring humility and lists bring pride. Bible principles exalt a relationship with God. List living exalts religion. Bible principles answer every question. And your list of rules, no matter how long it is, always falls short somewhere along the line. When I was growing up, you know, all the, all the preachers preached against going to the movies. You don't have to worry about that now. They're all shut down. <laughs> but then I am, I'm of that era where the VCR, some of you don't even know what that is, I understand. The VCR was invented. It was like a primitive recordable DVD system. You don't even know what that is, do you? It was like, <sighs> nobody preached against that. Nobody say anything about that. Why not? Was it, was it just that building down the street that was evil? Was it, was that the, well, no. It was just as important what you sat and watched in your house as what you watched in that building down the street. But we got so wrapped up in the specific that we forgot all about the principle. And so we had people sitting in our churches watching stuff at home that they never would have gone down the street and watched and feeling no guilt or shame at all. I mean, watching filth. And now they just stream it on their phone. Why? Because we missed the principle somewhere along the line. Well, I don't go to the movie theater, so I'm spiritual. So you, you sit at home and watch it. That, that makes you spiritual? No. Bible principle is far more important than the specific application. Listen, five years from now, it might not even be downloads. I don't know what it'll be. Push the button on your forehead and watch it in the sky. I have no idea. Link it with your chip. It's all for your own good. Don't worry. It's okay. It'll be okay. It's the only way you can go to Walmart. Go for it. Amen. There'll be more room in heaven. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm messing with you. Loosen up just a little bit. Okay. Do you understand why Bible principle is so important? So young people, yesterday I gave you that first one that's so vitally important that you can, you can run through everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If it doesn't pass the test on that first one, and that covers everything in your life, then you ought to voluntarily put it out. Amen. Just voluntarily put it out. Let me, let me give you 47 more this morning. <laughs> that was my introduction. Don't get nervous, preachers. You've done the same thing. Amen. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now I'm ready for lunch too, so it, it won't be long. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not an unfamiliar verse. Look, if you would, verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, it's the same thing that he wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 8, where he said, For ye were sometimes darkness, now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
So here in 2 Corinthians, he says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Wonderful verse, wonderful truth. But it's more than that. It's a Bible principle. You see, if I am in fact a new creature, like it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 8, if I am now light in the Lord, then I should walk as children of light. If I am light, then I need to quit trying to be darkness. If, if that's what I was, but I'm not anymore, then I need to leave that behind. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He hasn't just changed direction. He hasn't just changed location. He's become a completely new thing. He's become a new creature in Christ. And because I'm a new creature in Christ, then whatever it is that I have a question about, I told you I'd answer all your questions. You think, well, uh, what about uh, how should I wear my hair? What kind of clothes should I wear? Uh, what kind of uh, music should I listen to? What kind of things should I watch? What kind of people should I hang around with? I, I don't care what your question is. God has the answer in Bible principle. Does it glorify God? Does it even have the potential to glorify God? And then secondly, does it reflect that I'm a new creature in Christ? If I'm going to tell everybody I'm a new creature in Christ, then that ought to be reflected somehow in my life. Should it not? Yes, it should. We were, we were in uh, Minnesota. My, uh, when, I, when I was on staff at my home church there in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, I, had, I had a good choir and, and I was blessed. I had a young lady that could uh, read, sight read music and do it proficiently. You just hand her the music, she could just play it. And then she could also put the music away and play out of the hymnal and just improvise and do all kinds of stuff. Now, if you're not, if you're not a musician of that sort, you don't understand what a big deal that is. That's a big deal. Most people can do one or the other. And if they do one well, they usually don't do the other well. They might be able to do it, but not as well. This, this young lady, she could do it both. I mean, she did them both. She did them both very well. And she was still in high school. She was one of my high school students. And she's playing for the choir at the same time she's taking, taking music classes at the University of Alaska from this famous concert pianist. And he told her, he said, I don't want you to play for that choir anymore. He said, it's ruining your technique. And she said, as a little girl, she said, well, I'm never going to be a concert pianist, but I'm going to play in church all my life. Well, praise God. And she did. She kept playing. And she graduated from high school, went off to Bible college, and my piano player was gone, and she married some bozo, and off they went. <laughs> and again, one of the benefits of being around a little while is you get to see what happens in people's lives. So she married this young man called to the ministry. And the next time we saw him, uh, he was an assistant pastor in Maryland. And we got to catch up with him there. And then he was working on staff at a church in Washington. And we got to catch up with him there. And then one day he called me on the phone. He said, Brother Rogers, there's a church in Minnesota that has just called me to be their pastor. And we want you to come for a revival meeting. I said, we'd be glad to come. We would be thrilled to death. How long have you been there? He said, well, I haven't actually been there yet. I said, well, you better go first. <laughs> Just get the lay of the land and then call me. And then we'll, then we'll put it on the, on the schedule. And he called me back after he got there. He said, it's awesome. They're not doing anything. I can do whatever I want. So I said, well, praise God for that. And so we put it on the calendar. About a year and a half later, we went to, went to St. Paul. What, what's the name of the town? Just outside of St. Paul. And uh, we had a great time. He'd, he'd only been there just over a year and he's taking me around, showing me all the property and everything. And the, there were so many weeds and, and bushes over the sign. He was cutting it all back. And the next door neighbor came over and said, are they going to start having church here again? Well, they'd never stopped having church, but even the neighbor thought it was over. The pastor's wife had gone through a long period of, of illness and all of his time was spent caring for her and people began to filter away and the church was down to just a handful and they called this young man to be their pastor. And he's just so excited he can't stand it. And he was telling me how he got the windows cleaned off and he rented a thing to get up there and show me the property and all the, all the stuff. He just thrilled to death. 
I was standing back there. We had set up our, our table with our CDs and stuff. And I was standing back there. And this lady came in Sunday morning. And it was October or so in, in Minnesota. It was a little chilly. And she came in. She got a big coat on. And she'd been folding bulletins. And she put the bulletins down on the, on the table there. And introduced herself. And I said, hi. And then I smelled something. I thought, aha, a smoker. We got us a smoker in the house of God. Not only that, a smoker in a position of authority. She's folding bulletins. I know what kind of place this is. I don't know what I'm preaching on all week. The devil weed tobacco all week long. And I'm, I'm getting all stirred up. Here's this smoker folding, folding bulletins. And what kind of place is this? And, and then she ran off and, and the preacher came up and she said, and he said, oh, you met so-and-so. I said, yeah, I, I met her. Yeah. He said, well, she, she just got saved. So I think, oh, well, praise the Lord for that. He said, she was, she was in a motorcycle gang. Not, not dentists who ride Harleys on Saturday. We're talking the real thing. He said, not only was she in the motorcycle gang, she was the drug supplier for the whole group. Wow. And she got saved. And she's folding bulletins. Suddenly I'm like, praise God for smoking. Amen. <laughs> what a blessing. I mean, she's just taking massive leaps forward. And, and hey, if all you're doing is smoking, praise God. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of perspective. And, and so later on that, that, that morning, she came up and she, she's telling me all about her son. Her son who plays in a rock band. She said, my son plays in a rock band. He had gotten saved younger, but he grew up in her house. No emphasis on anything godly, never in church, nothing, knew nothing about God. She gets saved and he starts getting interested in the things of God. And, and so he started having a Bible study with the young pastor. They're meeting a couple days a week. They're just having a Bible study. She said, my son told me last night that he is going to quit playing in the rock band. He said he just doesn't believe it'd be honoring to God, so he's going to quit playing in the rock band. She said he won't be here this morning because he played in the rock band last night, and he told him he's going to give him a couple of weeks to find somebody to fill in, and, and sure enough, I checked. After those couple of weeks, he was done. That was it. I went to the pastor. I said, uh, did you tell him he had to quit the rock band? And he said, no, really, I didn't. He said, we were just doing a Bible study. We're just studying the Bible. And he decided to quit the rock band. I said, no, that's not how that works. No. You go to that kid the day after he shows up in church, say, get out of that filthy rock band and get out of it now. And, uh, except that. You see, when the Spirit of God does that, it'll last when you're not there to watch him anymore. When you make decisions because the Spirit of God did something in your heart, it'll last when the teacher and the preacher aren't there to watch you anymore. And that's the kind you want. That's the kind of decisions you want. He showed up for church Sunday night. Here's this young man, long blonde ponytail down to here. Beautiful hair. I'm a little jealous, a little jealous people. I don't know why God gives some people hair. I have no idea. Seems very arbitrary, but he does it that way. You just take what you're given and be thankful, amen. And if you can't put it there, put it here, amen. He showed up with that beautiful long ponytail. I thought, oh my, there he is. He sat there Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. He, he was there every night with his Bible open and his pen and his paper, and he took notes on everything. And he'd come to me after the service. He'd say, Brother Rogers, I missed that reference. And I want to go home and look that up. What was that verse? And he'd write it down. And he'd go home and he'd look it up. Listen, by the time we were done, I was saying, Lord, I wish I had a whole room full of those right there. Because he's, he's getting it. And he's paying attention and he's growing. What was happening? What was inside was being reflected on the outside. The last night we had spaghetti in the basement because that was the will of God. If you've ever traveled much, you know that it's quite often the will of God to have spaghetti in the basement. <laughs> uh, and we did that. We're sitting at a table and, and we're getting ready to eat. And the little lady came in. She sat down with, with Liz and myself. And she said, you want to see a picture of my son? I'm thinking, nope. Seen him all week long. 
She, and she insisted. You know how mothers are. She insisted. Well, I got a picture of my son. Do you want to see the picture of my son? Uh, finally, you just surrender. Okay, let's see the picture of the boy. I've seen him all week, you know, I, but here we go. She pulls out the phone and, and she shows us the picture. And here's this picture of this young man, a handsome young man with this nice masculine haircut. We said, what happened? She said, well, he was reading the Bible. And he came across that verse where it says, it's a shame for men to have long hair. And he said, mom, if it's a shame for a man to have long hair, do you suppose I should get my hair cut? And she said, I suppose you should. And he went and got his hair cut. She said, don't tell the preacher. I just want him to see on Sunday. So our lips are sealed. Will not tell a soul. That's not how you're supposed to, you're supposed to go to them and say, if it's not cut by next week, I'm cutting it right here in the, in the foyer. Except that when the Holy Spirit does it, you don't have to follow them around with scissors. So, but I, I don't want to wait that long. I want it to go faster. Well, why not just give God a little time? There might be a few things in your life that took a little time after you got saved. Maybe, just maybe. You might still have a few that God's being patient with. Amen. You may get there sooner or later. The truth is we all have a long way to go. Just some of us kind of cleaned up the outside a little bit. So nobody can tell how much, how, how much further we have to go. Others kind of wear it on the outside so you can see it when it comes off. And what was happening is that what was going on inside and his walk with God is growing and progressing and it's being reflected. What was happening in here was coming out. Do I even need to tell you that's what we want? That, that's what we want from these young people. We don't want little cookie cutters who've learned what to say and what to do and how to stay out of trouble. And then they walk out the door and we never see them again because they're done and they're tired. We don't want that. We want them to have a walk with God so that when they walk out the door, they're still following God. That's what we want. That's what we're looking for. But instead we fall into the trap of trying to teach people to be Christians. You can't teach somebody to be a Christian. You can't. It's something God does in their heart. And if verse number one of Ephesians chapter five is true in your life, then when you come across the Bible principle, God will be able to use that in your life to make real changes. You forgot what Ephesians 5 verse number 1 says? Therefore be ye followers of God as dear children. Too many people spend their lives doing what they have to do to not get kicked out of the choir or kicked out of the Christian school or kicked out of the, well, if I do that, I can't be an usher anymore. Okay, I'm glad you got some standards. But that's a dumb reason to do something. Well, I, I, can't, I can't dress like that or, or they'll kick me out of the choir. Well, then you probably shouldn't be in the choir anyway. Well, well, if I go there and the preacher sees me, I'll be in trouble. God already saw you. Why would you live a miserable life trying to hide from the preacher? The most important one already saw it. Amen? Why not, why not get it straight with him? That'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? The answer to your questions, whatever they are, whatever they are, it's Bible principle. And the problem is we've failed to convey that along the way somehow. And people who live by lists of rules get bitter. They do. Some last longer than others. But they get bitter. And they get tired. You, you can't live for God in the flesh and not get tired. And they get tired and then they run away from God and think they've found freedom when they haven't found freedom. They have found bondage and they didn't even know it. Listen, young people, you decide, first of all, you want to be a follower of God. And then you'll be able to understand, is this the will of the Lord for me today? Should I watch that? Should I go there? Should I listen to this? Should I spend time with that person? Listen, that, the answer to that question as far as the will of God is just as important as what kind of ministry does God want me in 20 years from now. 
Because if you don't get those little ones right, you'll never get the big ones right. You never will. And you need to decide now, I want to follow God, and I'm going to live according to Bible principle. And you'll be surprised what that would do in your life. I'll give you the other 46 tomorrow. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could be here this morning. Lord, thank you for these young people and their attentiveness the last couple of days. Lord, thank you for these preachers. Thank you for these preachers, for their faithfulness, for their hard work, for their desire to serve you and honor you. And God, I, I believe every one of them this morning, they have a desire to please you and honor you. God, help us to do that. And help us to be able to stand up and give an answer to every man of the hope that lieth in us. It's not tradition. It's not what somebody taught us one time. It's what the word of God says. God, help us to live accordingly. We'll thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen.